this lecture by renowned scholar, academic studies press author, and my friend, Professor David Bittier. If I were to characterize David's scholarly, creative, and more broadly speaking, pedagogical book, I would cite its pioneering nature. This draws from the fact that David Bittier was a student of, of one of the chief pioneers of academic Pushkin studies, Professor Thomas Shu, the founder of the American School of Pushkin studies. It was from Thomas Shu that David Bittier inherited this mantle. I speak namely of a capacity for general conceptualization. While Soviet scholars were very successful at studying Pushkin empirically, the theoretical and conceptual side of scholarship was usually left untouched. This important aspect of conceptualization often passed to their American colleagues, namely to David Bittier. Of course, David's pioneering scholarship has not been limited to Pushkin. He has conducted work in poetics on Joseph Brodsky and Vladimir Nabokov. Nonetheless, it seems to me that Pushkin's studies has remained a steadfast focus of Professor Bittier's scholarship. And in his regard, in this regard, I would note the publication of facsimile editions of Pushkin books with landmark commentaries supervised by Professor Bittier. This edition practically came to supersede the Russian academic collected works that still have not come to full fruition. The Pushkin Center at the University of Wisconsin in Madison has for many years been the heart of not only, not only American, but international Pushkin scholarship. I would also like to speak separately on David's last book, The Pushkin Project, Russia's favorite writer, modern evolutionary thought, and teaching inner city youth. This book reflects Professor Bittier's best features as scholar, as called, in my opinion, this manifests in the fact that his scholarship, David always preferred uh, to uh, always preferred to tr uh, less traveled by uh, the past. This approach is reflected in this book, which will present today, and that was published in a series rather untraditional for literary scholarship. A specialized series called Evolution, Cognition, and the Arts. The series is led by one of the greatest specialists in evolutionary theory and a demanding series editor, Professor Brian Boyd. David's book presents him entering a new field and applying evolutionary theory to Pushkin studies, something that few have thought to do before him. I also like to note that there is another innovative aspect in the book, the pedagogical aspect. It reflects David's experience as the director of the Pushkin Project, a summer school for children from low-income 
and underprivileged households in Chicago. Betia was able to teach these children through Pushkin. I like to conclude this introduction with a quote from David's own introduction to his book. We learn from those whom we love. And certainly, I have no doubt that David's students learned from him because they loved him as a mentor. I think that this quote has another aspect, that David himself loves his readers, students, and colleagues. I'd now like to turn the word over to David himself. David, please. Thank you, Igor. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and welcome, everybody. I'm not seeing you here, um, but uh, I'm assuming you're there. Uh, and I'd also like to uh, give a brief shout out to my former students, including those in the Pushka Summer Program. I hope some of you are here. Okay. So the story I want to talk to you about today involves adaptation and change in the academic world, a world that has been my home now for more than five decades. Its cast of characters are the following. High school students from inner city neighborhoods in Chicago and Baltimore, Russia's most famous writer and the language and culture in which he expressed himself, and a big picture explanatory framework that brings the different elements of the story together under one umbrella. Last September, I published a book at Academic Studies Press entitled The Pushkin Project, Russia's Favorite Writer, uh, Modern Evolutionary Thought and Teaching Inner City Youth. In the book and in the program the book is about, I tried as it were to juggle four very different colored balls in the air simultaneously. First, the kids of the Pushkin Summer Institute, PSI, and their backgrounds, more about them momentarily. Second, Pushkin as a source of cultural and linguistic energy. Third, the pedagogical best practices and cognitive cross-training techniques behind the Pushkin Project. And fourth, how modern evolutionary thought can help these young people see in clearer perspective the options they have going forward, not merely for surviving, but more importantly, flourishing as human beings in the 21st century. Combining these ideas in this way seemed out of the box, to put it mildly, but I was hoping it would become clear that it was, there was a method to my madness. Even when talking about learning the Russian language or studying Pushkin or doing something practical with that knowledge, my primary focus for these young people was always process oriented. That is how the human cultural realm mimics the biological realm and how we create, including the products of our minds, how, and how we create, including the products of our minds, that is involved in its own life cycle and its own effort to sustain itself until it can't. All the balls needed to be in motion and the hand-to-eye coordination, as it were, seamless for a quasi-magical effect. In this case, a true aha pedagogical experience to happen. From the early 2000s, if not before, it became abundantly clear to me that the study of humanities, by which I mean mainly but not exclusively, literature, history, philosophy, and language, was experiencing a seismic realignment, what philosopher of science Thomas Kuhn would call a, a, a paradigm shift, and that the expectations upon which those of us who entered the professions in the 1970s and 80s needed to be, be fundamentally rethought. Change was coming from the outside in. Students 
tended to take humanities classes out of interest or to fulfill a requirement, but not out of a sense of calling. In a word, we were not where the action was. I gradually came to feel that something ought to be done to reorient our messaging and extend it beyond the arid confines of the contemporary ivory tower, adapt or perish. To push against this powerful current seemed both necessary and not a little quixotic. Part of the problem was the poisonous hot air of the culture wars. And part, of the, and part was the economic reality that had overtaken colleges and universities in the States and the UK. Professors like me were trained to be specialists, not to think about the big picture. The new normal was of course not that new by then. It was dominating many professions, especially after the stock market crash of 2008. In my world, students were in effect clients. It was their bums in the seats that mattered. And it was a department's record of billable hours. It's a metaphor, but not really. That could be presented to a dean and counted on a spreadsheet that allowed the unit to grow or shrink. Tenure existed, but sacred cows could still be gored. Maybe they couldn't come for you individually, at least not yet, but they could come for you as a group, as a, as a discipline in need of downsizing. The fact that Darwin's 200th birthday arrived in 2009 amid much fanfare seemed almost fortuitous. A reminder that we, the professoriate, were also subject to evolutionary pressures and that we needed to find a way and fast to work with or around the change that was defining us. In a word, our profession as humanities teachers was coming face to face with Herbert Spencer's famous description of natural selection after reading on the origin of species, quote, survival of the fittest, unquote. In this environment, we were not particularly fit. What could we do? How could we make ourselves useful in ways that were still intellectually rigorous and honest, but that allowed us to adapt, to strike out in new directions? In our case, as Russian studies professors, Russia was not going away as a geopolitical force to be contended with, nor was the underlying culture that lay behind those geopolitical ambitions. We needed to develop new audiences and we needed to provide them with a skill set that, that would be useful to them both immediately and long term. My first stop in conceptualizing this skill set was the Russian language itself. The underserved high school audiences upon whom we set our sights would reap a twofold benefit by learning Russian. First, the self-discipline necessary to learn this challenging language with any proficiency would serve them well going forward. And second, this achievement would look good on their college applications. But I also had a personal reason for starting here. I had learned Russian in the Navy at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey in the early 1970s. And it had changed my life forever. Studying Russian with native speakers for eight hours a day for 47 weeks, using pattern practice drills and repeating phrases with shifting grammatical forms, primarily noun and adjective case endings and verb conjugations, until they became second nature, was an experience unlike anything I had ever known. Those drills laid a solid foundation and provided the neural pathways that eventually allowed me to say things with a high degree of speed and accuracy. Their experience was very intense. Many of the vocabulary items had semantic ties to the military, but we would play, for them, play with them, creating phrases that I remember to this day, such as, well, there I fired a shot, hit a duck. By learning to communicate in Russian, and in time reading more broadly, 
and writing in Russian. I came to think in terms of the other to the point where I could see my own culture, including its blind spots from the outside. That's the point that was most life altering. It turned out that grammatical form played a role, not only in what, in what one thought, but in how one would. Everything that came after, grad school, jobs, the decades as teacher scholar followed from this. And it was precisely this cognitive frisson, this sense that my brain had added a different gear that I wanted to pass on to students in a way they could use to grow up and grow out into a changing world. Looking back on it later, especially after my forays into evolutionary thought, it struck me as not unlike the process of co-optive adaptation, also called exaptation, say bird feathers as thermal insulators morphing into bird feathers as flight enablers. Not only, only in this case, the mental act of learning something for practical purposes was morphing into a new mental space with an entirely different viewpoint. And once in that space, I felt as though I was embodying a new me. Why did I decide to call the undertaking the Pushkin Project? First, it had to do with the uniquely infectious poetic culture of Alexander Pushkin. 1799-1837, Russia's most beloved, indeed universally recognized as most Russian hero from its famously literocentric past. Pushkin, much more than Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, is routinely compared in his importance to Russians to Shakespeare in the Anglophone world. But why exactly? Well, my decades long study of Pushkin had shown me that the quiddity most defining the poet had to do not only with his art's surpassing beauty, which was very real to those who could read and perhaps more important, speak aloud the verses, but also with the creative way he transmuted various experiences from his life into his art. As the great scholar Yuri Lortman put it, quote, like the mythological King Midas, who turned everything he touched to gold, Pushkin turned everything he touched to creativity, to art, unquote. The challenge here, of course, one taken up most notoriously by Nabokov and his Onyegin translation is, can the Pushkinian quiddity be successfully conveyed to a non-Russian audience. Then there was a second reason to connect my brainchild to Pushkin. The fact that the poet's African heritage on his mother's side was instrumental in his sense of identity and in crucial aspects of his artistic legacy. I became convinced that this connection was fortuitous and potentially utilizable. Pushkin's life story, his unique ancestry, and his supreme ability to turn adverse circumstances presented to him by life into poems, plays, novels, and stories beloved by millions could be repackaged to inspire young people from a different culture. In this case, American high school students from Latino and African American populations who may have their own challenging circumstances to overcome. How we found these students and their schools is a different story, which time does not permit me to go into here, but suffice it to say, the happy result of that adventure has been our close collaboration for many years now with teachers and leadership at two campuses of the Noble Network in Chicago, Pritzker College Prep, and the Noble Academy, and Friend School in Baltimore. Now, two deep-seated idea clusters embedded in all human beings' personal stories are those involving moral choice on the one hand and romantic choice, known in evolutionary terms 
as sexual selection on the other. Here our students are no exceptions. In this next part of my talk, we'll consider how Pushkin's short tail, the station master, which I have taught for years in the PSI, foregrounds these choices in ways that our students can relate to and think productively about. The point as in everything else involve, involving how cultural evolution overlays biological evolution is not to present an evolutionary big picture of deterministic lockstep, but one in which options for future viability are weighed and evaluated. But as we might expect with Pushkin, these issues are handled in an unorthodox way, a way that flips on its head a universally revered biblical parable. And this reversal of expectations is not only playful in a serious way, Pushkin's trademark, it also shows new life emerging, which is the essence of the evolutionary process. In this respect, it is an ideal text for young people thinking about the future. The role of the Russian language in bringing aspects of the decision-making process to the surface is, as always with Pushkin, key. The station master begins with the musings of a state functionary, titular counselor A.G.N. From the outset, our narrator operates in a stylistic register designed to whip up feelings of compassion for the plight of station masters, those poor souls at the bottom of the civil service hierarchy who run the post houses where teams of horses are changed for the next leg of a journey. Usually these individuals are retired soldiers, one generation removed from the peasantry or serfdom. Their lives are difficult because the status of a new arrival, say that of a nobleman or a high ranking officer can trump that of a traveler who has been waiting in line for hours for the next available horses with the result that the station master is blamed and sometimes physically abused or the delay. After lamenting the plight of station masters in general, the narrator proceeds to tell us a story about a specific station master, Samson Virin. The tale begins with a younger version of the titular counselor appearing at Virin's station after a downpour and feeling grumpy and in need of a change of clothes. Two things immediately attract his attention upon entering the building. The station master's daughter and a set of pictures adorning the station house wall. First, the daughter. Hey, Dunya, called out the station master. Light the samovar and go get cream. At these, go get some cream. At these words, as these words were pronounced, a young girl aged about 14 appeared from behind the partition and ran out onto the porch. I was struck by her beauty. Is that your daughter? I asked the station master. Aye, truly she is, answered he, with an air of satisfaction and pride. And what a sensible, clever girl, just like her late mother, unquote. Next, the pictures. I passed the time by looking at the pictures that adorned his humble but neat dwelling. They illustrated the parable of the prodigal son. In the first one, a venerable old man in nightcap and dressing gown was bidding farewell to a restless youth who was hastily accepting his blessing and a bag of money. The second one depicted the young man's lewd behavior in vivid colors. He was seated at a table surrounded by false friends and shameless women. Farther on, the ruined youth and rags and a three-cornered hat on his head was tending swine and sharing their meal. Deep sorrow and repentance were reflected in his features. The last picture showed his return to his father. The warm-hearted old man in the same nightcap and dressing gown was running forward to meet him. The prodigal son was on his knees. In the background, 
the cook was killing the fatted calf and the elder brother was asking the servants about the cause of all the rejoicing, unquote. While preparing the tea, Dunya notices that the young narrator can't take his eyes off her. Her reaction is not shyness. She has spent time in her father's uncivil world and answers his questions without hesitation. He, the narrator, calls her playfully a little coquette. This too is not an irrelevant detail. Next, the narrator plies Viren with punch, alcoholic, another leitmotif, to loosen his tongue and get him to share his stories. The three become fast friends and the stereotype of the difficult station master and the depressing station fade away. The last thing that happens before our young traveler leaves the station is that he asks Dunya, who has accompanied him to the cart, for a kiss, which she grants him. Several years later, the narrator is in the area again and recalls the pleasant, vital station master and his comely daughter. He decides to drop by to see how the two are doing. He finds Widen much changed, palpably older, withdrawn, sullen. He also notices that the station house has fallen into disrepair. There are no flowers in the window, and most importantly, there is no dunya. With the help of some more rum-laced punch, Virin tells the story of what happened to his beloved daughter. Three years ago, a handsome young husser named Minsky was traveling through and demanded horses. His first reaction upon learning that no horses were available was to raise his voice and his whip. But as soon as he saw Dunya, he calmed down and found an excuse to linger at the station. He ordered something to eat. When Virin went out to sea to the exchange of horses, he returned to find Minsky seriously ill. The guest had to stay the night, and the next day, with him worse, a doctor was summoned. Several days of bed rest were prescribed. During Minsky's recovery, Dunya tended to him constantly, wrapping his head with a cool cloth and bringing him lemonade to drink. When it was finally time for the husser to leave, he offered to take Dunya to mass at the other end of the village. Dunya hesitated, but at her father's urging, agreed to go with Minsky. Almost as soon as Dunya left, the station master suspected that something was amiss. When he traced her steps, he learned that she did not take mass that day, and that, indeed, she continued on of her own free will with Minsky, but was crying the entire way. Taking leave from his post and tracking down the Husser's domicile to fashionable St. Petersburg, Vrydin decided to go and, quote, bring back his lost sheep from another biblical parable. He located Minsky at a high-class hotel, and when he confronted the young man, Minsky reacted in a manner consistent with his wealth and his aristocratic station. He recognized Vrydin, acknowledged breezily his guilt, explained that what had happened couldn't be undone, told him he couldn't part with Dunya, stuffed some banknotes into his sleeve and quickly ushered him out the door. In other words, in this world dominated by class and power, Minsky took what he wanted without compunction. Defeated in this exchange, Vidin was ready to return home to the station. But before doing so, he wanted to see his poor Dunya one last time. That evening, after praying in church, Vudin noticed by chance Minsky's carriage passing in the street. It stopped before an apartment house, and the husser himself jumped out, ran up the steps, and disappeared into the building. By cleverly asking some questions, Vudin ascertained that this was where Minsky was keeping Dunya. He bluffed his way into the building and knocked at the door of the apartment in question. When the door was opened by a servant, the agitated father rushed past her and made his way to the edge of the sitting room, where Dunya and Minsky were seated 
in the following fashion, quote, In the room, which was elegantly furnished, he saw Minsky seated deep in thought. Dunya, dressed in all the finery of the latest fashion, sat on the arm of his easy chair like a lady rider on an English saddle. She was looking at Minsky with tenderness, winding his dark locks around her fingers, which glittered with rings. Poor station master. Never had his daughter appeared so beautiful to him. He could not help admiring her." End quote. When Dunya looked up and saw her father, she fell to the floor in a faint. On this occasion, Minsky was not apologetic to his pursuer. He accused uh, Vuiren of stalking him like an assassin and threw him out onto the stairwell. In the end, Vuiren was forced to accept the state of affairs the injustice of the class structure that allowed someone to first deceive him and then steal his daughter in this manner. But this stage of the story was still not quite ended. The station master wrapped up his loss of Dunya in the following way, quote, it's almost three years now, he concluded, that I've been living without Dunya, having no news of her whatsoever. Whether she's alive or dead, God only knows. She's not the first, nor will she be the last, to be seduced by some rake passing through, to be kept for a while and then discarded. There are many of them in Petersburg, of these foolish young ones, today attired in satin and velvet, but tomorrow, verily I say, sweeping the streets with the riffraff of the alehouse. Sometimes when you think that Dunya might be perishing right there with them, you cannot help sinning in your heart and wishing her in the grave. The final stage of the story involves a third visit by the narrator. More change has taken place. It's been a year since Vuiden has died and his station house is now occupied by a brewer. The brewer's wife tells the narrator that Vuiden died of drink. The narrator laments his wasted trip and the seven rubles it cost him to hire the horses to bring him here. It is autumn, the most dismal time in a dismal part of the country. Before leaving, however, the narrator, narrator asks the brewer's wife where Viren is buried. She sends her ragamuffin son, Vanka, to show him the way. The little cemetery on the outskirts of town where the station master's grave is located turns out to be in the narrator's telling, one of the saddest sights he has ever seen. As a place, it is a fitting setting for the tears, the slyozi, that are the trademark of Vidin's story. But in pointing out the grave, the boy provides some significant new information. The station master's resting place has not been totally forgotten. In fact, it was visited by a magnificent lady sometime after Vidin died. Quote, there was a lady, though, traveled through these parts in the summer. She did ask after the old station master and went a visiting his grave. What sort of lady, I asked. A wonderful lady, replied the urchin. She was traveling in a coach and six with three little masters, a nurse and a black pug. When they told her the old station master had died, she started weeping and said to the children, you behave yourselves while I go to the graveyard. I offered to take her, I did, but the lady said she knew the way. And she gave me a silver five kopeck piece, such a nice lady, end quote. This information causes titular counselor Agen to change his mind about the futility of his final trip. He too gives the boy a five kopeck piece and no longer regrets either the trip or the seven ruble expense. I've presented the plot of the station master in detail because the force field spreading out between the literal meaning of Wyden's and Dunya's story and its blurred, semantically shaded opposite is precisely where the learning and conceptual experimentation take place that are essential fitness skills. By parsing Virin's and Dunya's actions, 
as well as a narrator's responses to those actions. The students test themselves on where they come down on the dividing line between parental love and filial devotion on the one hand and exogamous desire, that is marrying or mating outside of one social group on the other. One strategy which Pushkin often uses is to appeal to two types of readers simultaneously, or rather to a younger, less sophisticated reader and then to an older, more sophisticated version of the same reader, all within the same story. That is what is happening here. The irony of the storyline becomes immediately discernible once I ask the students to keep the parable of the prodigal son in mind as they analyze Dunya's choices as seemingly wayward child and Vidin's reactions as doting parent. First, Dunya is not a son, but a daughter, and her options, given her social class and sex, are even fewer than those open to Widen. Here we notice that the father's feelings for his offspring are perhaps forgivable, but they also reflect back on himself. He brags about her svidam davoinova samolyubia, which is literally with the appearance of self-satisfied pride or vanity. And they do nothing to promote the girl's personal growth and independence. Her role in the station house is to perform the same chores as her mother. Second, Dunya is uh, given no patrimony, no, no bag of money that she then squanders among false friends and shameless lovers. Indeed, despite the ambiguity of her relations with Minsky, she is never presented as displaying anything approaching lewd behavior in the parable second picture. When Vuidin does find her, she is not dressed in rags, sharing provender with sw swine, but attired and bejeweled in the latest fashion. Third, Vuidin does not act as the kind father waiting at home in the parable. Instead, he flips roles and goes out looking for his lost sheep from another parable. And fourth, when his prodigal daughter finally does return home, she is not greeted by the forgiving father, but by his silent judging grave. I asked the students to consider, again, Vidin's social class and where the moral precepts in the story are coming from. Vidin is not educated, and the pictures depicting the prodigal son's pathway from greedy adolescent to contrite young man are accompanied by some decorous German verses, which the station master cannot read. In other words, neither the parable as pictured on the wall nor its linguistic glosses help Vidin in his search for his daughter. He ignores what the parable is instructing the good father to do, that is wait at home for the son to return. And moreover, in his ignorance, he is taken advantage of by others, here, the doctor conversing with Minsky in German, who used their superior knowledge against him. This is, of course, completely unfair and is the basis of the tears shed by the station master in his telling and the sympathy that the narrator feels for him as he listens. But there are conflicting emotions taking place in this word picture of Wieden and his plight. And that is where Pushkin's irony and the need for a conceptual experimentation on the reader's part come in. Here, for example, is how evolutionary biologist and primatologist Franz de Waal sees morality as growing out of the animal world and not being superimposed from outside or above. Quote, this brings me back to my bottom up approach or view of morality. The moral law is not imposed from above or derived from some well-reasoned principles. Rather, it arises from ingrained values that have been there since the beginning of time. The most fundamental one derives from the survival value of the group, the desire to belong, to get along, to love and be loved, prompts us to do everything in our power to stay on good terms with those on whom we depend. Other social primates share this value 
and rely on the same filter between emotion and action to reach a mutually agreeable modus vivendi. We see this filter at work when chimpanzee males suppress a brawl over a female, or when baboon males act as if they fail to notice a peanut. It all comes down to inhibitions, end quote. If we think about Vedan's actions in the story and apply DeWall's evolutionary lens to them, other considerations emerge. To begin with, the well-reasoned principles of the church, however revered and practiced over generations, may not work in certain situations. Experimentation may be needed if survival is at stake. The hallmarks of morality, empathy, fair play, reciprocity, compassion, altruism, sacrifice for the group may not be enough if the self is in danger of disappearing entirely. That is Dunya's quandary, which her father, who loves her dearly but blindly, cannot see. She is everything to her father, but she has no life of her own, which Pushkin characteristically leaves unsaid. When I discuss this with the students, I ask them questions which bring out a more Dunya-centric view of the plot. The most linguistically telling moment in the station master is when the narrator explains the station master's mistake in letting Dunya go in the following way, quote, later the poor station master could not understand how he could have permitted Dunya to go off with a husser. What had blinded him? In Russian, the what had blinded him is rendered literally as how the blindness had come upon him. It is an impersonal construction. The word for station master in Russian is smatriti, or he who looks after, a kind of watchman. Vidin believes he has not looked properly after his daughter and that by mistake he has let her get away. But that is not what the morality of the tale is really about, or at least not the morality as viewed by an older, more sophisticated reader, the one I'm urging my students to grow into. The father is smitten by the daughter's beauty and cleverness, but in his pride, he can see her only in the role as housekeeper, station ornament, and charmer of disgruntled travelers. Through the narrator, Pushkin presents Vyden's case in a sympathetic light. Our students virtually, universally, unanimously are on the side of Vyden when we begin to discuss uh, what has happened. But then we consider Dunya and her life choices and the range of morally acceptable positions expands. Morality and fair play exist in the balance between the individual and the group. The point is that this is all there already in what linguistically is the equivalent of the cellular level in Pushkin's puns and plot construction. Initially, our sympathy for the abandoned father leads us in one direction, which is reinforced by the narrator's rhetorical embellishments, the poor station master, etc. But then the play with words including the blindness that, uh, that obstructs the watching man's vision, leads us in another direction. The other bottom-up shaper of emotional and cognitive responses in the, to the story is sexual selection, a term Pushkin would not have used, but which he understood implicitly. Now I ask the students, especially our female students, who are trying to develop their own skill sets to survive in a complicated world, to imagine themselves as Dunya. What are Dunya's realistic option given, options given her station in life? Lest we forget, Pushkin has given Dunya a peasant name. She is not called Tatiana or Oiga. Thus, everywhere she goes in life, those who pay attention to social hierarchies will know her first by what her name suggests. This would not be much different from a young female today with a name like Juana or Jayla, as opposed to Jane or Joan. Dunya is the underdog. In the story, she makes a miraculous transformation from Devichka, generic girl, to Barinya, 
married lady of rank, although there is no evidence in the text that she and Minsky have married. This transformation is highly improbable, but Pushkin brings it to life against the odds and in the constant shadow of the prodigal son parable. Why? Because the poet's creativity is always on the side of young life emerging and of the experiments and risks taken that end up bearing fruit. This is where our current understanding of sexual selection comes in. Minsky has the wealth and social status, but it is ultimately Dunya who chooses him. She is the one taking the risks. Her moment of decision, captured in her hesitation to leave with Minsky when he offers to drive her to church, is a crucial inflection point in the story. As with so much else having to do, ha having to do with the discovery of the of the imminence with an A of our animal nature, it all goes back to Darwin. And perhaps the most important shift in Darwin's thinking as he progressed from On the Origin of Species, 1859, to Descent of Man, 1871, was his honing in on the role of sexual selection as opposed to natural selection in the evolutionary process. Quote, sexual selection as opposed to natural selection um, so sexual selection depends on the success of certain individuals over others of the same sex in relation to the propagation of the species, whilst natural selection depends on the success of both sexes at all ages in relation to the general conditions of life." Unquote. Using birds as his most vivid examples, Darwin showed that in certain animals with sufficiently developed nervous systems, and cerebral capacity. What tended to happen with regard to the propagation of the species was that choices were made that were aesthetically motivated, having to do with physical ornamentation and allure or song or dance, rather than strictly pragmatic or having to do with protection, the strength or combative ability of the male, or health, no obvious disease. Darwin's description of the, the astonishing displays of the male Argus pheasant and the equally astonishing responses of the female Argus pheasant to those displays makes the hard science attempts to treat this interaction as purely practical and not about an ever more extravagant beauty seem purblind. Quote, again, Darwin, I know of no fact in natural history more wonderful than that the female Argus pheasant should be able to appreciate the exquisite shading of the ball and socket ornaments and the elegant patterns on the wing feathers of the male. I differ only in the conviction that the male Argus pheasant acquired his beauty gradually through the females having preferred during many generations the more highly ornamented males the aesthetic capacity of the females having been advanced through exercise or habit in the same manner as our own taste is gradually improved." Unquote. The economy of mating sequence that Darwin observes so brilliantly here, which we could render in shorthand as increase in male ornamental beauty leads to increase in female interest receptivity shifted the focus to the female for the first time. No longer was it simply the aggressive male mounting the passive female because it was time to mate and the urge was there, which would be how natural selection explained it in the Victorian era. Now it becomes a function of female choice precisely because that is what the female desires. Through extensive field work and laboratory study, Yale ornithologist Richard Frum makes the case for a science more attuned to how animals, in this case birds, experience the aesthetic in nature. For example, the male bowerbird constructs an elaborate bower for the female made of brightly colored objects and twigs that is tantamount to a miniature throne room. The interested female then comes through the back door and tries out the throne to see if it appeals to her. 
If it doesn't, she exits out the front door of the bower structure. If it does, she remains in place to mate. Quote, here from. Essentially, the evolutionary function of the bower is to provide a setting for aesthetic evaluation that also protects the female from date rape. Because bowers function as both objects of choice and enhancements of the freedom of choice, they create a kind of ever escalating aesthetic evolutionary feedback, end quote. Prum's research indicates moreover that this exercise of choice is deliberate and based on a careful winnowing process. In short, the ladies are shopping for a male that pleases them. These two value force fields, morality and sexual selection, are at the heart of the station master and Dunya's difficult choice. This is yet another reason why our students need Pushkin, because he presents these issues in a terse story form that communicates intellectually or cognitively and touches emotionally at the same time. Whilst more, while more, most children want to eventually, but sometimes sooner than is wise, assert their independence from their parents and venture out into the broader world on their own, they don't also don't want to hurt their parents while doing so. This desire not to hurt is primarily moral. The socialization they have learned, growing up in the family, going to school, attending church, joining clubs, playing sports, etc. At the same time, another desire that adolescents on the verge of adulthood experience is sexual. And in this instance, they face what Dunya faced, how to fit one's need for an erotic partner and ultimately one's choice of mate into the larger picture of living a good life. Pushkin captures this agonizing decision-making process through the eyes of the father as well as through the eyes of the sympathetic narrator. When Virin sees Dunya caressing Minsky, it is she who is physically playing with his dark curls. We are witness to all the power and beauty of this mate choice in a minimum of words, Pushkin's signature, that only brings out the pain of the father and the sexual attraction, even obsessiveness of the young couple more forcefully. Once again, the crucial scene, quote, Dunya, dressed in all the finery of the latest fashion, sat on the arm of his easy chair, like a lady rider on an English saddle. She was looking at Minsky with tenderness, winding his dark locks around her fingers, which glittered with rings. Poor station master, never had his daughter appeared so beautiful to him, he could not help admiring her." End quote. Why would Dunya be looking at Minsky tenderly and touching him in this way, except that she loves him. Here it is Dunya who seems in control. She sits on the arm of the chair like a lady rider on an English saddle. Minsky is situated not above her, the mount, but below her as though he is the one being ridden. Her beauty is culturally mediated, cloaked in the latest finery and ornamented with glittering rings, signs of social status, that make her more desirable. But she understands and Pushkin understands that for young life to emerge, her beauty needs to be joined with Minsky's dashing vitality and social capital, while her father, who has the strong moral claim, can only look on in misery. The duty of the station master not only survives, she survives, one might say, beautifully. She survives as a woman making tough choices, a woman who may be aware of her own beauty, the little coquette of the opening scene, but who is not sentimental about that beauty. Natural selection moves forward passively, stumbling onto ways to survive without thinking about it. But sexual selection, because it chooses based on what it wants, makes itself aware of itself as it decides. It also is linked to the birth of artistic representation. Because artistic representation, when done well, gives us a sense of life emerging, which involves sex to be sure, but is also more than sex. The reason the narrator was pleased by the ending to the tale provided by Vanka 
was because it reinserted a moral counterweight to the earlier scenes of Dunya choosing her own desires over her father's. The story needs the lad's vivid description of the wonderful lady who comes to visit the station master's grave. Pushkin, in his playful seriousness, tells a modern parable of the prodigal son that is turned upside down in every way. Son is daughter, daughter is not prodigal, father turns to drink and becomes prodigal himself, daughter returns to father too late, father doesn't forgive child, the quote, you cannot help sinning in your heart and wishing her in her grave, etc. The church's prescriptions don't help when applied too narrowly, but the essence of the moral worldview is retained. Dunya does feel guilty that she abandoned her father and she knows that her happiness, the well-heeled barchata, the, the, the little masters, the nursemaid, the lapdog, the impressive carriage, that has all been purchased at a cost. She shows this by tipping vodka and making an offering at the church. We never find out whether Minsky and Dunya have wed, as Pushkin refuses to close this loop. Common law marriages between noblemen and women outside their social class did happen. In any event, it is beside the point. Pushkin, who had difficult relations with his own parents, wrote the story on the eve of his marriage to one of the most beautiful young women in Russia, Natalia Goncharova. He too was trying to find a balance between a past littered with mistakes of prodigality and the prospect of married life and new family. And he was writing these efforts into the station master by giving his heroine agency, something he would do increasingly with the female characters of his mature period. Like Dunya, many of the students of the Pushkin Project come from humble beginnings. In closing, let us not forget that titular counselor Agya N was only too happy to ask the 14-year-old Dunya for a kiss as the story opens. Dunya's only way out of her situation was by leveraging her cleverness and good looks to get a foothold in something better. It was a risk and she could have failed but Pushkin decided to write his Cinderella story in this way because Dunya's beauty was not skin deep. Pushkin believed in beauty. Minsky seems like a cad, but maybe his worth, despite the way he treats Vlirin, lies precisely in the fact that he valued Dunya's beauty for what it was, and he made her the mother of his children. Dunya's story is a fairy tale, at least with regard to her unlikely success. And Pushkin clearly enjoyed turning the church's preachings on their head in this way. But the larger point is the good Dunya's beauty does for the group. When she tells her children to wait patiently in the carriage and behave themselves, one senses she is a good mother. Our students, fortunately, are not typically faced with a dilemma like Dunya's and have already weighed up the advantages and disadvantages of becoming family prematurely and decided against it. But going forward, it is hoped that the full import of Dunya's gamble, its troubling morality versus sexual selection nexus will not be lost on them. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. So, uh, dear guest, if somebody uh, wants to ask a question, please raise your hand. There is a special button raising your hands. Uh, click it and we will see that you have your hand raised and our moderator, Asia, will give you a vote. Please. So, please question. Another way to ask question is just to uh, to, to, to write the, your questions uh, in, in, in a chart. Yes, Professor Delich wants to ask question. I say, please give a word to Professor Ian Delich. Yutia, join as pen. 
<laughs> First, I would, of course, like to thank Professor Bethe for a wonderful lecture, as was expected. <laughs> what occurred to me is that there is perhaps one, yet one more um, religious context. I forget the number in the Ten Commandments, but doesn't it say that you have to abandon your parents when you meet, when you are ready to continue the history of mankind, so to say? Uh, you know what I'm speaking of? The, is it the four, fourth commandment or the fifth commandment that you have to abandon your parents when the time for marriage has come? Uh, I think you're supposed to honor your mother and father. But even, also to abandon even, them when the time is ripe. Oh, um, I'm not remembering that. I should know that wording. Igor, do you know that wording from the... Um, I, dare, I dare to say that there is no such a comment. There is just a kind of mention in the uh, in the first book of Bible in Genesis, that a person then oh. just uh, needs to abandon his mother and father. But um, within ten comments, there is a comment to respect and love parents, not to abandon them. <laughs> but if it is in Genesis, it must carry some weight as well. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> well, so, a web of religious contexts. It was a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Irene. Yes. Thank you. Uh, dear panelists, there is a question from Tom Dolak. Uh, he asks, to what extent are Pushkin's work his Bauer? Ah. Um, Tom Dolak, to what extent are, is all of Pushkin's oeuvre his own bower? Is it, did I understand that correctly? Maybe. Wait a second. Let me see. What's this? Yes, that was the. Um, yeah, there is. To what are Pushkin's uh, works his bower? In the question. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, at, Absolutely, absolutely. In other words, uh, the way that he constructs uh, his 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 own works, whether his stories or his poems or whatever, or the bower that he creates for um, presumably uh, some lovely person to come in the back door and decide whether they want to stay there or not or exit the front door. I mean, you know, obviously very metaphorical, very, uh, uh, but uh, certainly with his his love poetry, I would think that there is some element of that going on. Um, but I'm not sure, uh, you know, how much it works into sort of the economy of uh, maybe not finding a permanent mate, but uh, maybe the the some a kind of a hookup culture thing or something. But um, De you know, definitely, I think with his, a his, he had lots of female readers, and uh, especially with his poetry and his love poetry, I think there'd be some element of that going on. Okay. Um, do you guess more questions? Yeah, I see another. Ah, Daria Salotka. Hello, Dasha. I'm not, nice to see you. Um, and thank you for a uh, beautiful spell. <laughs> thank you, Dasha. Uh, I guess I would. Um, so I, I just see the question and answer. I don't know if that's a question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yes. Here's something. Here's yes, something. maybe we uh, have Julian more. Conley. Okay. Hi, Julian. Uh, Igor, can any of these people talk or they have to type it all? They have to be uh, mute? I think that if they want, certainly uh, we have a question 
yeah. from uh, Jill, Drew and Connolly. Julian, Julian, you can unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm asking. Yes. Okay, yeah. I'm unmuted. Can you hear okay. me? Hey, yeah, Julian. Hi, so this is just a comment. I mean, David, I love what you had to say. I agree with everything you say 100%. I, I like you giving this evolutionary framework that um, you know fleshes out uh, our interpretation and makes, I think, really a wonderful way to reach students. Um, my, I was going to make a, a footnote, you might say, to Professor Dalich's comment about leaving father and mother. That's actually from the New Testament. That's Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. Um, the, the quote is, for this for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother yes. and shall cleave to his wife. Cleave to his wife, yes. And the, and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no more two, but one flesh. And what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Uh, right. but, that, but that does have the idea of leaving the father and the mother to form a new bond. And that's thank, all. Thank you very much. And Igor, you can be forgiven for not knowing about the New Testament there. No, no, I know about this, but it's not a comment. This I'm is absolutely you, the kidding. mention about about these subjects. Also, we can read in 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 Bible what you call Old Testament, yeah. uh, and absolutely true. But this is not a comment. There is only one thing I I wanted to mention. Thank no, you. No, I, I was just kidding. And Julian, that's a great. Thank you very much. And I definitely think that that's that's going on there. For sure, the you know the the Matthew, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there is a, also a question by anonymous attendee. Uh, your work speaks much to the younger generations and their perspectives. In what ways did your students in the Pushkin Summer Program introduce new concepts, ideas, interpretations to you across these topics, including? Re, uh, your experience in literary scholarship and how does that tie into your learnings in evolutionary biology? Wow, uh, big question. Um, thank you very much. Uh, um, first of all, working with these young people has been the most amazing experience in, in ped pedagogical experience in my life. And I've you know, developed very strong relationships with them over the last 12, 13 years, and um, the very much uh, their perspective, because uh, their kind of cultural literacy is not anything like the cultural literacy I had at their age. And so therefore, I had to try to be as attuned to them as possible. Um, for them, they could, they could understand in principle, sort of intellectually, that Pushkin was a big deal in Russia. But, you know, Pushkin exists in their world on the same plane with uh, Drake and Bad Bunny, maybe below Drake and Bad Bunny. And so it's, it, it really is very much, uh, you have to relate, relate Pushkin to the whole idea of how popular culture works. And that's why I think it's important that we try to reach out and try to find new audiences. I think what, what Pushkin does in a short story like this and in other of his works, when he speaks to two uh, readerships at the same time, a sort of less sophisticated and more sophisticated, is that uh, it can it can and, and and I think only great writers do that. I don't I don't think all writers are able to uh, somehow appeal to both readerships simultaneously. But my I, I saw my uh, mission, my charge to try to first of all get the story to appeal to them. As a, as as a as a good story on on their level, I mean, it's a very sad story. What happens to Vyrin? And they and you know and and it it brings tears to your eyes when you think about the father. But then also, if you can kind of get them to focus a little bit more on Dunya's dilemma, then you can get them to maybe add that other perspective. And that's that's where it changed the most for me. When I taught Pushkin starting out, I was teaching Pushkin only as a kind of uh, great writer with all, and, and, and it was mostly uh, like a, at a graduate level. You don't, you don't teach that much Pushkin as, at an undergraduate level. And so you have to, to uh, when you teach it as a graduate seminar, make your graduate students aware of the massive amount of scholarship of the highest level. I have such respect for the great Russian philologists that I, you know, read and studied 
uh, um, studied as, as I was coming along. I mean, that tradition is an amazing, amazing tradition. But um, change happens, and I think it's sort of important that we try to change somehow, and that's why I came up with this, with this project. Uh, so that that sort of response to uh, your question about um, what's you know, how I related to the students, the evolutionary biology, the evolutionary biology, and um, you know cultural, it, it, it's basically the intersection between biological evolution and cultural evolution, and how they're they're they run very much parallel to each other. And I just tried to make the students aware of that without getting too far into the weeds because they didn't have a lot of training. And I, the last decade of my, of my academic life, I spent a lot of time studying uh, evolution. And so uh, I knew a lot more than most of, of them did. And, I, and I, so I tried to boil it down for them. So that's a long-winded answer, but that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's another question uh, in the chat by Edward Weisband. I'm sorry if I mispronounce. What were responses of your students that surprised you most? What were responses of your students that surprised you most? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, when we, when we study Pushkin and we uh, read some of the, the um, you know, Shogun, you have some of the great scholars who have written about the last year of Pushkin's life and his duel. The, the, you know, he, he died in a duel or as a result of a duel defending his wife's honor. And um, there, there's a certain, you know, and, and Alexander Hamilton also died in a duel, uh, different circumstances. Um, but anyway, so there's a certain amount of I won't say romance anymore more because duels are are I mean they're 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 obviously uh anachronisms and and um the gun culture is is a very scary thing. I think what surprised me is that um the, some of these kids uh come from neighborhoods that are that are kind of uh not kind of, but that are are dangerous. There, there are dangerous elements in the neighborhoods. And um, one of my students, one of my favorite students, um, actually uh, a turning point in his life was he was near a park and saw somebody gunned down in a park. And so anything about Pushkin, the, the Pushkin, uh, uh, with, with Pushkin dying in the duel, you know, he said he admired very much uh, Pushkin's resilience and how he learned from his mistakes, but that that sort of uh, honor culture and the dual culture was something that he felt very much marred uh, Pushkin's record and marred marred his achievement. Um, and he and he said he didn't like Pushkin for that reason. So uh, I, I think that's what surprised me was uh, you know I I I, I would go into it thinking that maybe they would think that there was something cool about Pushkin being in all these duels. Uh, although I um, I think the, the only duel, as far as I know, in which someone was actually hurt and Pushkin was in a number of duels was the one in which he was, uh, uh, you know, ultimately died from the wound. But, but I, I felt there would be a different kind of response from them with regard to that, that sort of, uh, uh, you know, what? Tough, not uh, that 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 challenging kind of uh, du duelist side of Pushkin's personality, and I I found that no, I mean I think that they'd seen so much of it that they didn't like relate to the, any of that at all. So, um, the, there was a raised hand from Alisa Gillespie. Please ask a question. Um, oh, sorry, yes, okay, there's my video. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you so much, David, for, oh. can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. Okay, great. 
Thanks for such an amazing talk once again. It was it was a joy to hear you speaking. And um, I have a couple of um, I have a couple of I guess Pushkin questions that came out of um, what you said. You said towards the end of your talk that you see Pushkin as giving increasingly more agency to excuse me to his female characters as time goes on. Um, and um, I guess maybe I wanted to push back on that a little bit because it seems to me that from the start, he gives a lot of agency to his female characters. So that's that's one thing. But then if you see a transition, I was curious where you see that and, and how and why you see that. I mean, I'm thinking all the way back to like Ruslan and Ludmila with Ludmila putting on the invisibility <laughs> cap and you know being able to evade her potential rapist and things like that. Um, and you're, it's interesting, you're right, that um, all those acts of female agency, I think, in Pushkin relate to mate choice or avoidance of some type of sexual violence or something along those lines. lines. It's all, it all seems to be kind of sex or mate choice related. Um, but I wonder if there are other types of agency that you see um, as well. But yeah, when I just think through of and it doesn't always end well. It's not always new life emerging, but there always seems to be a kind of agency, whether it's the nameless heroine of Kafkaski Plenik deciding to, you know, save save her beloved, or like I said, Ludmila, or whether it's um, Marina Mnishik and Boris Gudunov, or, you know, of course, um, later heroines too, like Tatiana most famously um, choosing her mate, um, and, or whether it's, um, like Lisa in um, Queen of Spades, which you've also written about in the same book. Uh, so I'm just curious about that, how you see that. Do you actually see a transition? And if so, how and why? And do you see other, other kind of spheres of agency? And then if I can complicate my question just a little bit more, I wonder if you saw the light bulb going on for your students in terms of thinking about what this sort of agency looks like and whether you saw transformations and not only for the female students, um, but for the male students in terms of how they think about, um, you know, sort of gender roles and choice possibilities and limitations in their own world, their own lives and stuff like that. So sorry, kind of multi multi-part, but you can speak to whichever part of it you, you would rather. Yeah, thanks, Elisa, great, great questions. Um, I'd have to go over, you know, a lot of the territory to, to um, you know, revisit that generalization. I think maybe what I was thinking about is in the transition from, from poetic form more to prosaic form, where the, we, you know, we get uh, characters like uh, Masha Mironova in, in uh, Kapitan's In the Captain's Daughter, uh, and Tatiana, of course, uh, with a novel in verse, and then in some of the in some of the short stories like Peak of Ayadama, 1833. So I, I'd have to go, th I think in the transition from poetry to prose, I think in, in a prosaic space, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, Pushkin was always interested in cultivating more female readers as, and, and that was a very important part of his reputation. And obviously the females are important in all his works and you're completely correct to point out, even going back to the Slani Ludmila, that the, the, the females are very clever and they do clever things and, and they you know, are, are able to act on their own. So um, uh, I'd have to be you know, very careful in calibrating, but it was, I think it was more part of going from the poetic space where it's, it's um, you know, more, more kind of un, unreal, I guess, or, you know, it's, it's, it's with the, the poetic part, it's more sort of conventional. And then you go into the prosaic space where uh, it's, um, you know, possibly, although with Pushkin, the poetic, uh, the, the prosaic space often has a lot of poetic uh, constructions in the poetic space. So it's not a pure prosaic space, like say a Tolstoy, but in any event, I, I'm, I'm thinking, thinking more along those lines. But I think what you said is, I, I agree that the the clever and resourceful female characters are always there. I think just maybe once we get into the 1830s, 
we sort of and, and Pushkin again, especially with when he's married and, and, and with his own wife, he he wants for her to to uh, be be a better reader and to read more and to also develop the her Russian. And so there's a kind of almost educational quality to it that maybe there's that's less present in the some of the earlier stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now your second question was. What was your second question again? Whether you, you know, in leading your students through whom I'm just guessing who may come from backgrounds where gender roles are more sort of traditionally circumscribed, whether leading them through this really enlightening, um, you know, to this enlightening new understanding of what might seem to be a kind of narrow moralistic text at first reading, um, whether you see that expanding their thinking about gender roles in their own lives for themselves, you know, whether that's evident, um, whether it, whether it's, you know, going back to the beginning of your talk, is it, is it transformative for them in, in a way that goes beyond the literature? I think what was perhaps um, most transformative for the students in the, in the Pushkin Summer Institute and then in the, our other Pushkin programs is is actually the uh, sense of community that they develop. It's almost like I'd like to align it with Pushkin's Lyceum, which was which was his uh, most um, inspirational community. But um, I, I th they they became very close and very bonded because of the community, and, and that continued on with regard to the gender roles when we're when we were talking about them in class or discussing them in class, uh, they would, you know, say, for example, in the station master, like I said, they were very much kind of on the side of Virin, and that to to get them to become uh, sort of um, p p not playful, but to uh, um, you know try out, in, at least, even as points of discussion, try out different options. I I I wouldn't say that I would say, see the light bulb going off very brightly at that moment. I think you know we would talk about it, we would dispute it, we would uh, th they would they would finally come to understand that you know maybe Dunya had to do something because she was stuck in her situation. They maybe would acknowledge that, but I think most of the time they would still feel conventionally kind of sorry for. Viren and um, that and maybe over time some of that stuff sinks in and you know maybe a few years later or whatever then it then the light bulb goes off but I wouldn't say that I was seeing a lot of light bulbs going off in media's race anything like that yeah really interesting well thanks again for a great book and a great yeah. talk <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Professor Biteo we have two more questions yeah. Uh, we have Diana L. Tello Browers. Okay. Please ask a question. Hi. Um, I was actually one of your students um, back in 2018. I remember. So I remember. You. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, and I just really wanted to say um, it was an intriguing lecture. I haven't heard you speak in so long, so I really missed that. Um, and so that was nice to hear. I'm excited to read the book. Um, and I did want to kind of give a little note on it was an enlightening experience to be in Pushkin. Um, I have continued on with my Russian studies. And actually, I see Tom Dolik is on here. And he was actually one of my uh, Middlebury professors. Um, so that's an example of how Pushkin and PSI, the program itself, has really just changed, has been life changing for me. And I kind of just wanted to give you a shout out for that because if it so weren't- wonderful, for, thank you, Dennis. Really I wouldn't good. be where I'm at. <laughs> it's so wonderful to to um, to, to, to see, I, I remember your name and are, are you are you married? I am married, yes. I, I got married mm -hmm. last year um, and I live in Michigan now. So, you know, doing oh, life. <laughs> wow. Well, congratulations. Thank you so much for, uh, uh, you know, coming, coming virtually to the talk and good luck with you. And I'm so glad that that Russian has stayed part of your life somehow. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being part of that. And I hope to visit you soon. I'm hoping this summer 
I can head down to Madison and say hi. That would be great. That would be great. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye. Okay, we have uh, three more questions in our chat. I'll be reading them one after another. So the question is from Robert Woodward. Uh, can we see the I'm sorry, the prodigal son parable as the exemplar of a parent's unconditional love for his child? The father in Pushkin's story fails to understand this, while the daughter does appear to, gra to grasp this. Okay, um, I can't see Bob. Is he there? Um, Doesn't matter. But get, uh, that's that's fine. Okay, I'll try to answer Bob. Um, uh, I I there. I see your. Okay. Um, good good question. Uh, I, I'm I, here. I, you're there. Good, Bob. Yeah. I think I think what's what's uh, what's going on, at least from Pushkin's perspective, and Pushkin. Mm -hmm uh was was playful in you know in these matters and uh wasn't particularly uh um he he whether this is useful or not he he was raised as a uh uh you know in in the russian church but in a kind of casual fashion and uh uh it, so i'll just leave that uh, you know, at uh, at that for now. But the the point about the literal uh, prodigal son parable, how it's literally interpreted versus freely interpreted. Um, the uh, what the the father does in the story is that he takes the the parable of the lost sheep instead of the parable of the prodigal son, and uh, he goes off and tries to bring back the lost sheep, which is is not the parable of the prodigal son, uh, and the um, so, uh, and and that's not you know to imply criticism of Viren because Viren want, is trying to get his daughter back, and um, uh, uh, and and he you know he's just devastated by this this whole this whole process. Uh, so that that part's clearly there. Um, the daughter, uh, I, I, I think one of the things that's going on here, Bob, is that um, Pushkin is uh, trying to get himself ready to get married. This is happening right in the fall before he gets married in the uh, you know, right after New Year's of the next year in, in 31. So this is the fall of 1830. He, and he's engaged. And he's uh, trying to get himself ready to get married, and he's very superstitious about the whole thing. Um, and uh, he wants to. Uh, he he's made a lot of mistakes of his own uh, lapses. I mean, his own choices. But he's done a lot of stupid things, and he realizes that. And so uh, now he wants to uh, be more a more responsible grown up and get married and start a family. And so he's trying to deal with those past mistakes uh, as he gets as he gets ready to to get married. So when uh, Dunya leaves his leaves her father and she's uh, obviously experiencing all sorts of uh, you know, pain and anxiety and, and c conflicted feelings when she's leaving with Minsky uh, and feels very bad about it. And she's crying the whole way. Uh, um, and, 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 and so she's not acting the way that the prodigal son is acting in the parable. And then when she comes back at the end, she comes back at the end and she feels very remorseful. And this, this remorse part, I interpret, it's just my interpretation, but I you know, as Pushkin is getting ready to get married, he's trying to um, uh, look at his own past in a uh, uh, a way to kind of uh, accept his mistakes and try to try to to move on and be worthy of this young woman that he's marrying. And I think when Dunya comes back at the end, and there is a, there is a kind of moral. Uh, level moral aspect inserted into the plot because she does return. She returns too late. The father's 
passed away. She feels terribly guilty about it. And, um, uh, you know, she shows that remorse by um, wh which we might not think much of it, but it's symbolically important. She gives the tip to the, to the kid and then leaves an offering at the church. So there is a kind of moral dimension that's reinserted back in, but it comes with the baggage of having left your father. So it's not black and white, it's mixed, which was, it was mixed for Pushkin as well. So I think that's why it's like that. It's not black and white. I, I don't know if that answered your question, but I well, think- Well, I was really reacting to your uh, focus on the prodigal son uh, pictures on the wall in the station. Yeah. And whether the uh, story of the prodigal son is really turned on its head uh -huh. um, in this short story by Pushkin. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure it is uh -huh. uh, because, I mean, my own uh, take on uh, matters uh, typically is an economic uh, analysis. And um, I wonder whether the daughter um, really thinks she's made a mistake uh -huh. or not. It's an unfortunate consequence of what turned out to be a very good uh, choice uh, to leave her father. Uh, I mean, certainly in a material uh, sense, it's uh, very fortunate. And the fact of the three children, as well as a coach and all the surrounding uh, economic benefits uh, can't be overlooked in my mind. Uh, it clearly turned out for the best for the daughter, I would say, uh, compared to what her existence might have become had she remained with the father. Uh, the uh, fault is the father's for mm -hmm. uh, failing to recognize this, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, and he uh, resorted to alcohol and killed himself mm -hmm. uh, as a result. And, you know, that's a shame. But had he really grasped hold of the unconditional love uh, that a parent owes a child and a child owes a parent, um, it might have been different. Mm -hmm. He might have still been around when his daughter visited the um, station and uh, apparently was seeking a uh, a reunion mm -hmm. at that point. She didn't mm -hmm. know he had died. Um, and, um, you know, I think she was uh, presumably coming back to uh, give her father the happy news that things had turned out for the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, G great comments, all, all great comments. Um, and my only uh, um, sort of uh, ca caveat or clarification would be, uh, I'm, you know, I think an economic lens or an economic interpretation uh, may, I mean, she's clearly successful and is in a good place in terms of her social status and her and her wealth and all of that. Uh, um, and still loved her father. 
and still and still loved her father. Right. He was coming back to show him how things turned out for her. Yeah. yeah. I uh, for for me at least, I'm thinking that uh, it was important for Pushkin that she wouldn't get back in time. That it was too late because that was the baggage that he was trying to work out himself, and he was projecting onto her that um you know uh that that it it couldn't have a, it couldn't have a happy ending because of how the whole prodigal son uh story had been handled up up to then everything was flipped the other way uh and pushkin by the way the the parable of the prodigal son was probably pushkin's si signature myth about himself he 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 saw himself as a prodigal son yeah. and and used that a lot but anyway i mean i think what you say i think what you say is very good about uh she she didn't know that he died and she was coming back to sh to tell him that it had worked out okay i think that's a a, a very astute comment yeah. thank you okay we have uh two more questions in chat um yeah. Yeah, maybe we should, you know. No, no, it's I'm, I'm very excited. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, okay. So the first question is from Daria Salotka. Uh, in which respect, if any, do you think Pushkin's fatalism may be related to some modern research in determinism? For instance, Robert Sapolsky determined, which basically states that everything we do is predetermined. Okay, uh, where is Dasha Salotka? I haven't seen her in years. Is she is there? Is she on here? Uh, let me check. Yeah. Ah, oh, Dasha, but uh, all I see is your picture. So I, I you, you, okay, that's all right. Um, so, so Dasha, I, I, uh, don't think that the, uh, that there's much determinism going on here. Now, fatalism in Pushkin, yes, to Pushkin, there was definitely a fatalistic aspect to Pushkin. And, uh, you know, when he goes out to his, to the duel, he's, he's very fatalistic about it. Um, but I don't think that, uh, and I, I I know of the Sapolsky book. I haven't read it. Uh, it's a cute peach, and I haven't have I have it in my bookshelf. Um, but in any event, I I don't I don't think of this evolutionary stuff as being deterministic at all. What what I what I the only only way it's deterministic is that if you want to sur survive or you want things to be uh, sustainable in your niche. Let's say our niche is we are humanities teachers in the university in 2024. How does one survive in that niche? Everything is, is in context. Then you have to, what are your options? You have to figure out what your options are. And then you have to uh, be flexible and be able to change if necessary in order to make that niche work or have that niche grow into something different. But I don't, I, I, I don't see it as deterministic other than that. So um, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's where I'm coming from. Thank you, yeah. Thank you. Is Dasha there? Can she talk? Uh, yeah, I think, but maybe the the microphone is not that good. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. 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 So uh, the last question is from uh, Carol Emerson. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. A spectacular intermix of Darwin and Pushkin in one of your deepest readings of the station master we have. Thank you, David. And the question is building of Alisa's. What about lessons for the man? Are there, in your opinion, other Minsky types later in Russian literature that beat your paradigm? Say Tolstoy's Count Vronsky, also the Dashian officer, also succumbing to beauty, also growing impressively as he awakens Anna and attempts to stand by her, given his own voice as Minsky is not. But an AK, all parties end in darkness rather than family bower of light. Okay. Uh, so we, can we give a word to Professor Emerson? Is it possible? Yeah, sure. I was just reading like the ones that were types mm -hmm. that's okay um i'll i'll try to uh by the way all the, questions i didn't get available. You, yep. i'm here can you hear oh, me very good yes, yes. great great i, I, I didn't get I, just, I i didn't get the bauer part at the end <laughs> the bauer part is simply a paraphrase of you i can't seem to unmask my black thing here i'm trying to 
open my video, but I don't have an option. So I'll just read this last portion. What is it in AK that ends up with all parties being in darkness rather than in a family bower of light? And I guess, David, the reason that I got interested in this was partly because of Alyssa's comment that there must be lessons for the men here too. Tolstoy's Count Vronsky seems to be something like a Pushkinian Minsky in the sense that he was also an officer, also succumbed to beauty, also awakened a female that he attempts to stand by but who cannot. Right. But he's given a voice and Minsky, of course, is not. He's allowed to hover around the edges of the scenario and the entire story is told through the father and the daughter. So I wondered if you had other thoughts about this Minsky prototype as it evolves later Russian literature. The reason I mentioned Tolstoy, of course, is that the rereading of Pushkin was what triggered the beginning of the writing of Anna Karenina. So I'll let you free associate on that. Yeah, great question. And I um I I I I think what I'm what I'm getting at when I'm talking about uh say Pushkin loves beauty is uh I'm I'm and and we don't know what da, what Dunya uh looks like. I mean she's just described as as you know pretty or 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 attractive or or whatever, but um, she's not giving given a uh, any kind of detailed portrait, mm -hmm. and um, what what I you know and Bronsky's a great uh, analog. I I I think um, it 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 has more to do with physical beauty, and I think that Anna Karenina definitely had more than just a kind of uh, you know physical beauty. But then what happens over the course of that novel with Tolstoy kind of uh, stepping on the um, pedal there is that it it morphs into this ugly ugly version of of a romantic love with no way out that it has to be romantic love and if it can't be this romant this romantic love then I'm not going to be attractive in the same way mm -hmm. and and therefore we can't morph into something other than that Pushkin right. doesn't you know, for, for Pushkin, those categories aren't there, I yeah. don't think. But I, I completely agree about the Vronsky thing. And I, I mean, I you know, Vronsky for me is just uh, a character of m much less substance than Anna. I mean, he, he's just a, you know, very weak, pale, I, you know, I, I don't think it's fair to condemn him too much because, he you know, he's very much uh, taken with her. But um, he's not a very appeal. Uh, there's nothing, nothing really wrong with him. He's just not very appealing, mm -hmm. and uh, he does. He, he's limited. He's very limited. And I, you know, there's. So I think uh, now I'm. I am rambling. But it's like with 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 Anna, at the beginning of the novel, she has this special quality that everybody uh, recognizes. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, but then there's something she feels, especially uh, you know, she, something is missing in her life. Um, uh, but but she has this life force, uh, and and uh, Vronsky falls madly in love with her, and she falls madly in love with Vronsky. And um, I I don't think what Pushkin is doing in in portraying Minsky is uh there there's no there's no depth to minsky there's the only thing is that he's deep in thought you know i don't know what he's deep in thought about but he's deep in thought in that in that one uh that, that one that one scene mm -hmm. um but but i don't i i i'm really tongue-tied carol i don't know <laughs> what you know where, where what to do with uh, i i it, 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 it the the male characters in the presence of that kind of beauty, don't distinguish themselves very well, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I think that is a traditional view of Vronsky. I happen to be a, a fan of his. I think he grows enormously given the givens. 
He begins as a character type, much the way Minsky begins, but we are allowed to see him wanting to marry Anna, wanting to have her care about their children, wanting a divorce. Of course, the timing is terrible, but we see all of this more or less from inside his perspective, given again the givens, which are nothing like what is given Anna or Levin, of course, in that novel. And I think what interests me is how Pushkin manages so delicately not to tell large parts of the story. Right. It was practically impossible for Tolstoy not to tell parts of the story that he cared about. He could get rid of parts he didn't care about. But I think he cares about Vronsky as he cares about Oblonsky, this type of person. Yes. But that's all need be said about this. Thank you for that wonderful, wonderful lecture. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. Okay, I think that questions are all over. So um, thank you so much, David, for your lecturing. Thank you. Thank you, Hopefully Igor. See you and my again, apologies so. for not for not uh, uh, signing in quickly enough. I was I, I was supposed to push a button and I didn't push the button. It's on my fault. I'm sorry that I was late. But luckily you have already pushed this button. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, bye thank bye. you. See you all. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you.